Welcome back to Presume Legal. I am Misha Janice, and this is the recap of trial day 11 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. The judge started today letting the defense know that her thoughts on the Katie McLaughlin testimony had not changed after yesterday's additional arguments, but that she would allow them a teeny bit of leeway when cross-examining Caitlin Albert about her relationship with Katie McLaughlin. So once Caitlin got back onto the stand, she was grilled about the extent of that relationship. They established that the two of them had social contact with each other as recently as June 2021 at their mutual friend Alyssa's baby shower. Also admitted were social events, road trips, beach trips that the two attended, as well as hangouts with the witness's college roommates, one even being in her very own kitchen. The two were also in, were the two were also track teammates in high school. While the jury wasn't able to see pictures of the girls, counsel used the pictures to refresh the memory of the witness. So the jury knows the pictures exist and they know that the two ran in the same circles. Now, the judge was not lying when she said she was putting the defense on a leash. But my opinion is that the girls' contact and friendship, whether close or not, was established despite the witness maintaining that Katie was only a friend of mutual friends. The defense asked Caitlin about the Friday night when everybody went back to 34 Fairview and whether she saw her dad and Brian Higgins leave the room at any time. She testified that they went to the family room, which was visible from the dining room where everybody was congregated. If you'll recall, her mom also testified that the men went to the family room. But her dad testified that he and Brian Higgins went upstairs to his son's room to show off some Marines memorabilia. Those testimonies conflicting may be something to keep in mind. I'm interested to hear what Brian Higgins has to say about this. Now, back on redirect, Caitlin testified that she only met Courtney Proctor's kids once, one time when she ran into her aunt, Julie, Julie Albert, while she was babysitting the Proctor kids. The witness was again asked about her dad and Higgins leaving the room with the party, and she said they were only gone for at most five minutes. On recross, the defense clarified that when the witness met the Proctor kids, it was two or three years ago, so 2021, 2022. This timing helps us see the continued and recent relationship certain members of the Albert family had with the Proctor family. The next witness was Tristan Morris, Caitlin Albert's boyfriend. On direct, he walked us through his movements on the evening of January 28th. When he picked Caitlin up from 34 Fairview, he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary about Caitlin or the surroundings early that morning. On cross, the defense established the closeness of this particular witness with the rest of the Albert and McCabe families. He and Caitlin had been dating for eight years, and he is well enmeshed into the family. Defense tried to no avail to get the witness to provide a time or even a time range that he picked Caitlin up from her house after the night out at the waterfall. Now, despite all efforts, the witness maintained that he doesn't remember times, and he refused to give any estimation of times of events that night. Now, he didn't strike me as combative or hostile, just someone who wasn't willing to give any thought to what was going on. For example, he was asked, did he pull into anywhere when he got to 34 Fairview? And he responded, he didn't remember. He was asked if there was somewhere other than the driveway to pull into at 34 Fairview, which he responded, no. So then he agreed to the conclusion that he must have pulled in the driveway. It was just incredibly frustrating to watch. And if Caitlin has to deal with somebody like that on a daily basis, then God bless her patient heart because I couldn't deal with it. He admitted that while waiting for his girlfriend to come to the car, there was nothing obstructing his view of the lawn. And like everybody else testified, he also saw nothing on the lawn. No body, no baseball hat, no shoe, no pieces of taillight and no tire tracks in the snow leading to the Albert's lawn that would indicate there having been a car crash. We learned that despite having been with the group earlier that night at Waterfalls and having 
pulled up to 34 Fairview in the early morning hours of the 29th, Trooper Proctor never spoke with Tristan Morris. In fact, nobody investigating the case spoke with him until May 2024. Yeah, last week. Now, there had been some testimony about the couple's plans for that night. Tristan knew he had to wake up by 3 a.m. to work, so he left Waterfall early and headed back to the home he shared with Caitlin to get some rest before going to work. When Caitlin testified, she said the plan was for Tristan to go home to rest, then pick her up in Canton, a 20-minute drive, to bring her back home before his work shift started. Defense tried saying that something changed that evening that required Caitlin to leave 34 Fairview in the middle of the night instead of simply staying at 34 Fairview the entire night, which would have made more sense instead of making Tristan miss out on sleep and drive in a blizzard to pick her up before his work shift started. So on redirect, the prosecution asked Tristan why Caitlin had him pick her up in the middle of the night when he should have been resting. In a moment of levity, the witness responded that she was high maintenance and he didn't want to have to deal with her with asking her questions. The next witness was Sarah Levinson, a high school friend of Brian Albert Jr.'s, who was at 34 Fairview celebrating his birthday with him. She testified that between 8 and 9 p.m., Courtney Alba, Catherine Duty, Emily Fabiano, Mary Kent all arrived at the house. At one point, Brian Jr. took a friend upstairs to see Chloe, and sometime after that, Colin showed up. She testified that at no point that night did she see anybody go into the basement, and at no point did she see John O'Keefe or Karen Reed in the house. When leaving the house, this is where things get interesting. She left with the McCabes and Julie Nagel. She testified that when they were pulling away from 34 Fairview, Julie, Julie Nagel, said something to her which caused her to turn her head to look out the passenger side car window next to her. But by that time, 34 Fairview was already behind them. She turned to ask Julie for clarification, but didn't receive anything. And on that cliffhanger, the court took a morning recess. When they came back, the cross-examination began. They established that the witness was not spoken to by any investigators until nine months after the incident. This witness gave us a bit more context to that night at the house in that she named all the party goers who were there to celebrate Brian Albert Jr.'s birthday. In total that night were eight of Brian's friends before midnight, and then the group from Waterfalls came. She was able to say when many of the friends left the party, but she admitted that she never saw Colin Albert, Brian Higgins, or Caitlin Albert leave the house. She testified that she never heard Chloe bark or growl or hear anything that might have happened in the basement. When she left the house, she assumed that she, Julie, and the McCabes, who were driving them home, were the last to leave. When she exited the house, she didn't notice anything on the lawn out of the ordinary. She testified that driving past the lawn, she wasn't looking, but didn't notice anything on the lawn. The last tidbit on Cross was Trooper Proctor was that inter... The last tidbit on Cross was that Trooper Proctor interviewed her nine months after the incident. But despite being visited by members of the defense team sometime after speaking with Proctor, the witness decided not to speak with the defense team before appearing for trial in the case. On redirect, the Commonwealth got the witness to clarify that her observation of the front lawn while walking out the front door and to the car in the driveway was limited to the walkway in front of her. So she wasn't looking at the entire expanse of the front yard. The next witness was Julie Nagel, another one of Brian Albert Jr.'s friends from high school, who was also at 34 Fairview that night. She testified that Brian Albert Sr. went upstairs at one point to get Chloe the dog, and that was the only time he went upstairs. Now, again, this contradicts his testimony that he brought Higgins upstairs at one point to show him stuff as well, as his testimony that he left the party before everyone went home to go relax in his bed. She too testified that neither Jer John nor Karen came into the house that night. And with regard to getting home, Julie had sent her brother a text just after midnight asking if he could pick her up. Before her brother got there, 
she was sitting at the dining room table in the spot right in front of the windows, looking out onto the front lawn and the street. She looked out the window three different times and noticed a black SUV first in front of the mailbox, then pulled up a bit, no longer in front of the mailbox, and then lastly pulled up closer to the flagpole near the property line. Her brother Ryan, his friend Ricky, and his girlfriend Heather showed up at 34 Fairview to pick Julie up sometime later. When they pulled up, the black SUV was gone. They were parked at the end of the driveway. Julie went outside, walked out the front door and down the driveway to get to the truck and invited them to come inside. Well, they declined to go inside, so she said she'll find a different ride home. She testified that she doesn't recall if there were tire tracks in the snow where the black SUV was, but that she didn't see inside the vehicle or see anybody get out of the vehicle or see any footprints in the snow. She testified that when she, Julie, and the McCabe's left the house for the night, they all left together. The ladies started talking as the car pulled away from the house, with Jen McCabe turned in the front passenger seat to direct her attention to the girls in the back seat. The witness said she noticed a black blob on the ground near the flagpole as they were passing 34 Fairview. She described it as a five to six foot long object but said it was pretty dark and the snow was heavy, so it was hard to see too much. But the black object was close to the street, but on the lawn next to the flagpole. She said out loud something like, I think I might have saw something, but I'm not sure what it was. Sarah in the seat next to her asked her what? But the witness was intoxicated and couldn't provide any more details. On cross-examination, defense first established that Trooper Proctor didn't speak with her until eight months after John's death. Next, they got into the close relationship that this witness has with the Albert family and the McCabe's. She's known Brian Jr. for many years, been to the house many times, been to the McCabe's house, driven their kids around, and dog sat for them. Speaking of dogs, the witness testified that when Brian Sr. retrieved Chloe from, ups from upstairs to let her outside, he maintained a close grip on her leash. She testified that she never went down to the basement and that she never really noticed Colin that night. She didn't see him arrive or leave. She was asked about the timeline of that evening around when she texted her brother to pick her up. Now, this is when I noticed how aggravated she was getting with defense's questions. She admitted that she took a screenshot of the text message to her brother but denied remembering whether she provided the picture of that screenshot to investigators or the prosecution. She denied remembering whether it's still on her phone or if she deleted the text message. She couldn't remember anything about it, except that Jen McCabe had asked her for a copy of the screenshot, which the witness gave to her. After that line of questioning, the amount of her I don't knows seemed to skyrocket. She said she had a decent amount of alcohol that night. Now, with regard to her direct testimony about seeing the black SUV when she was still inside the house before her brother arrived, she admitted that she saw the vehicle move three times, first by the mailbox, then in the middle, then by the flagpole. And each time it moved, it was going at a safe speed, only progressing a few feet forward each time. She never saw the vehicle go in reverse, only forward. The witness said she left the house around 1.45 a.m. and at that time did not see a body on the lawn. On direct, we know that she testified about the black object she saw as the vehicle passed the 34 Fairview, Fairview property. But we learned that today was the first time she told anybody that the object she saw was five or six feet long. When she passed the property and saw the object, she did not think it was a body or a person that needed help. She didn't ask Matt McCabe to back up, to stop the vehicle, to go back to check what she saw. She didn't alert Brian Jr. that there was something weird in his yard. She didn't tell her friend Sarah, who was in the car next to her and who is a nurse, that somebody on the lawn might have needed help. She didn't tell Jen McCabe to let her brother-in-law, Brian Sr., who is a first responder that somebody in his yard needed help. 
Defense established that she had been drinking for hours that night and was drunk by the time she left. In a prior statement this witness gave, she said when she heard the next day what happened, she put two and two together, yet failed to call the Canton police or the DA to tell them what she had seen that night. The court adjourned for the day and the judge let the witness know that she'll have to come back in the morning for additional testimony. So that was the end of day 11 of the Karen Reed trial. Now, what are your thoughts so far? In my opinion, I'm still waiting for testimony that supports the Commonwealth's charges. And for one of the charges, the one that has an element of driving on under intoxication, at this point, I am totally unclear how they're proceeding with it because not one in the 31 witnesses that have testified so far has claimed that Karen was drunk, acted drunk, was drinking too much, or even a significant amount of alcohol, nothing. So there's absolutely nothing to support that charge at the moment. So we will continue to watch and see if anything changes, see the evidence that's going to be presented, hopefully. If it's not going to be presented, then why the charge? But um, at the moment, just waiting to see how things pan out. There are a lot of questions about these witnesses, the close relationship that they have with the Albert family and the McCabe family and the Proctor family and the bias that they may have as a result. So we'll continue watching and we'll see where that brings us. So I hope you will join me tomorrow for day 12 of the Karen Reed trial recap. Until then, peace.